you this week um, specifically that you'd like to tell us about and just praise the Lord for? We had a real good morning yesterday morning with our uh, quilting group. There were several more of us there. I think there was, what, nine, eight? Eight of us in and out throughout the day. And it, it's really a blessing to be there, to enjoy knowing what we're doing for someone else, feeling that Lord is wanting us to go that direction. You're missing out. If you can just cut a stream, or a stream, <laughs> cut on a scene, you'll have her made. If you can cut a stream, you'll do that too. It was a blessing. It was fun. I got to go. It was really fun. <laughs> you enjoy it. Blessing to have charity in her mom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> we had a good time. Is there any te other testimonies this evening? Yeah, Jerry, I'd like to thank the Lord. I call the PSN support. They said there was one more day of that praise Jesus. Amen. Well, I remember that day when the first time I said, Jesus, take this cancer out of my body. He heard me. Yes, he always hears us. And he always hears us. And this son, we've been married 40 years, and the 75th anniversary of the Air Force. Sunday, she gets tired of talking about the Air Force. <laughs> and there's so much a part of my life, and it really mm -hmm. loves it. It showed me so much. It taught me so much about people throughout the world, how they live, and what they do, and how much better is he's able to put his there. And just thank God for that. Thank you. 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 Joke about it, but it's not joking about it with me. I do that just you know, maybe I can just put someone to join the little period mm -hmm. and be able to protect our freedom and be on the uh, reason I do it. Amen. All right, well, let's go to page 564. We're going to say page 564.
you. Thank you. Good to be here tonight. Good to see everybody. See your smiling faces. Beautiful day out. Hope you had a good day. Better tomorrow. So, uh, anyway, I wanted to, uh, before I get started, uh, I made a little mistake on Sunday. I just wanted to make sure I corrected that. Uh, when I was talking to you guys on Psalm 1, on Psalm 1 chapter 1, uh, I left out a very important point. I, I, I actually alluded to it later. But I don't know how I missed it. But in verse 2 of that, of that chapter, it, said, it says, Blessed is the man that doesn't walk and stand and sit in counsel of the ungodly. But then it says, But he delights in the Lord's word and meditates on it, meditates on it day and night. So that's really the key, one of the keys to uh, being the kind of Christian that God wants you to be, the kind of person he wants you to be, is meditating on God's word, memorizing God's word, thinking about God's word. Uh, as much as, as much as you can. I mean, some people say, "Well, I'm not going to talk about the Bible 24 hours a day." Well, I kind of expect you to talk about the Bible 24 hours a day. But if you have God's Word in your heart and in your mind and your thoughts, uh, then when someone asks a question, you have an answer. Isn't that what Scripture tells us? Yeah. Uh, I had a gentleman today at the hospital, and he wanted to know about. Uh, suicide and I won't go into the details of it but uh, basically he wanted to know if his son was uh, was going to go to heaven even if he committed suicide and uh, so I was able to and I didn't expect that, that question but I, I answered that question before uh, so I was able to talk to him about that and uh, use some biblical examples and uh, I think he felt better about that afterwards. So that's so. The more we know God's word, the more we hide God's word in our heart. The more we think about it, listen to it, and delight in it. And really, you can tell, you can tell what, a person, what a person's life is built by what they take delight in. You know what I'm saying? I mentioned that a little bit on Sunday. Uh, and that, and, and Jesus Christ as our Savior and His Word should be the, and serving people should be the main things that we're concerned about in this world. Uh, because this place isn't our home, right? We're not going to be here very long. Uh, 60, 70 years, uh, maybe longer if you're really fortunate. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to make sure I said that to you guys because I, I kind of left that out a little bit and I apologize for that. So I don't know how that happened, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, just leave it at that. How's that? Okay? Uh, let me get this. So what, I'm getting this set up. Uh, I want to introduce this subject by, uh, and by the way, we're going to be in Matthew 22, but we're not going to quite yet, but um, I, want to, I want to distract you in my wedding day, okay? Uh, before I do that, there's some pretty crazy things that happen, but before I do that, I want you, anybody here that's married, if you're not married, you can't answer right, but maybe you point up, I guess. Uh, is there something that happened on your wedding day that was maybe humorous, or a little funny, or interesting, that you maybe like to just share. Anybody? Think about your wedding day. Not that, and that, not making fun of your wedding, okay? Well, I'm not asking you to do that. Can't think of our <laughs> but, uh, if, you, if, some, if you remember your wedding day, I'll do it every wedding day, by the way. Uh, was there something funny about your wedding day? Something humorous about your wedding day that you'd like to share? Well, I don't think anybody else really noticed it so much, but uh, the, the pastor was taking us to prayer. This uh -huh. was before we exchanged our vows. Yeah. And he was praying over us, and I was a rubbish rag, so I was praying. And he started the ceremony, and I still had my head bowed, and was still praying throughout the hymn, talking about the ceremony. <laughs> 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 and I brought him back, and they finally, finally nudged me, and I <laughs> I chuckled about it later, but I don't know if anybody else got chuckled about it or not. Okay, that'd be funny. Anybody else? Yeah, man. Whenever we was getting married, I started, we were supposed to kneel down. When I started to kneel down, I about fell, got my, both of us over. Oh, wow. <laughs> anybody notice it? Huh? Everybody knows it. Before <laughs> <laughs> I died, right? America's funniest menu. 
All right. You, you were gonna you were gonna say something, yeah. You were gonna yeah, say something. Well, I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh. Um, when we got married, um, it was a local church here in town, and the pastor was retiring, okay. so he married us on Saturday. And on Sunday, his, he was leaving town, never to come back. Oh, wow. So my husband always joked that the pastor that married us immediately left town. So. <laughs> 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 got out of town and you. <laughs> oh, I'll okay. take that person. <laughs> Anybody else? Something funny maybe happened here. I just this. remember the joy I felt when the Lord put us together. Uh, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've been married 36 years this year, so uh, we've got a long way to go still. But, um, Congratulations. Thank you. We got married in Michigan, so first of all, don't hold that against us. I'm in Michigan, <laughs> in Ohio, so that was maybe the first thing we say about our marriage. Uh, married, got married at, at Brenda's church, or her dad's church. Her dad did not marry us because he was, uh, he was quite sick. So her brother married us. Um, I was living in California. We met in California, so we flew out there and brought him my friend out there, my best man, and uh, I was very excited about it, of course, getting married. Uh, so we had, some, had quite a day, uh, quite, a, quite a day. Uh, so uh, there's a, there a couple things that happened. So like, first, when they light the candle, the candle went out. Uh, when uh, they went to sing the songs, they forgot the song, the words, the words of the song, and start over again. Uh, of course, they sang the wrong words. Um, what else happened? Oh, a piano player that I had brought, who lived in Michigan, but he was from California. Uh, he uh, was supposed to play for the service and for the reception. Because I was going to do another song at the reception. And uh, so as soon as her dad paid him, paid him the money to, for the come to do the piano play and gave him a check, he took off. So that was interesting. Uh, and uh, my brother-in-law, who married me, married us, uh, it was funny because it Back in those days, didn't have the cell, didn't have the cell phones, didn't have the clip there, so they did video camera, thing like that. My brother-in-law uh, was known for liking to eat, and so every time it was the reception was about an hour and a half, two hours long, and they filmed the whole thing. And every time they put the camera on him, <coughs> he was eating. Every time, he was two stuck, hours, he was stuck in his face. <laughs> like he literally ate for two hours. Uh, now he, he was he wasn't big, he wasn't that big, but. Uh, but it was just hilarious. And then we went on our honeymoon and we went to some different motels. And on both of them, they made, they made mistakes. The first one we went to in downtown Detroit, we had to go all the way up to the 67th floor. And uh, beautiful, we were on the river and uh, you could see Tiger Stadium and all that. And uh, we got into the room, knocked on the rope, you opened the key to open the room, and there's people stuck in there. Now we, now, we brought all our luggage up, so we had to both, I had to carry, I had about two or three bags each. So we had to go all, so we had to go all the way back down to the convention and tell the people at the desk that our, you gave us the room that somebody did. Oh, I'm so sorry. And uh, they sent us back up to the 68th floor on the elevator, and we finally got our room, and everything was fine, but the next morning, when we went to leave, we, nobody could get elevators because everybody was leaving at the same time. I had to walk down 68 floors of stairs with all the luggage in my hands. <coughs> you know, not a man, right? So, uh, and so I had to carry all the luggage with four or five bags. It was the Sunday school convention. Yeah, 60, 68 floors. That was, a, that was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> so, so we, I mean, say we had quite a, we had quite a wedding day, a couple days, um, and uh, it's all good, but. Uh, Oh, I forgot about that. The most funniest part, right? Yeah. So my wife, you know, you get your wedding dress on, right? So she got this long wedding dress on, and of course we we come out, and you know, everybody throws rice at you, right? Yeah. I don't know why people do that. But so we're going out the door to our convertible that we rented, and we're going out the door. And everybody's throwing rice at us, and while we're going into the car, and one young man, about, I would say young, he's about twenty-three. He throws, to, he, he, he chooses to throw a firecracker ass into the car. And we're both sitting in the car, and her dress, she's got her dress on, and the firecracker lands about this far from her dress and blows up. Had it been like one more half a foot, it would have got, got her dress and probably her dress in the car. 
So that would have been a disastrous. Uh, so I, I wasn't too happy after that, by the way. So uh, it wasn't really funny when it happened. But uh, when I look at it now, it's like, really? The guy threw a firecracker at us? So, uh, but we survived. And the Lord's blessed. So, uh, anyway, we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about uh, a wedding feast. I don't know how many weddings you've been to. Have you ever been to like, a wedding, kind of really big banquet dinner thing? But we're going to, we're going to talk about that tonight and uh, pull out some principles uh, in Matthew 22. So if you would, uh, why, don't you have, why don't you stand and uh, let's, read, let's read it. Okay, We're going to be in chapter 22. If you can, stand. Chapter 22 of Matthew. Matthew's a, one of the gospel writers that uh, wrote from a Jewish perspective, writing to the Jewish audience. And uh, he says, in response to the scribes and elders who asked him questions, trying to trap him continuously, and his disciples were also there, and he said, Jesus answered and spake unto them, saying, by parables, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call them that were invited to the wedding, and they would not come. So again, he sent out more servants, saying, Tell them that are invited that I've prepared my dinner for them. I've killed the oxen and the fattens, and all things are ready. So it's going to be a big shebang. Come and to the marriage. But those folks made light of it, made fun of it, and went their way, made excuses, one to his farm, another to his, his business or merchandise. Verse 6. And the remnant, or the rest of the guests that were invited, took his servants and treated them poorly, spitefully, and even killed some of them. But when the king heard of this, he was so angry. He sent forth his armies, and they destroyed those murderers, and he, they burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, you know, the wedding is ready, everything's prepared, but they which were invited were not worthy. So I want you to go into the highways, on the streets, as many as you can find, bring them to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they could be found, both the good and the bad, or the evil and the good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. So it was packed, they ended up being packed. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man there that didn't have on his wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, why, 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 why did you come into this wedding ceremony without your wedding garment? And it says he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, It says, I want you to bind him up hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we come before you right now. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for our, our marriages, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the people in this church. Thank you for the prayer requests we put out today. Lord, we just uh, ask God that you, the, your presence will be with us during this hour. And God, that you would just continue to heal and watch over your children. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings in this country. I ask God that uh, as we study this chapter, study this, this part of the chapter, chapter 22, God, that you give us insight into your word and into the heart of God uh, and to your son. And we pray now that you watch over us and uh, bless this time, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we read in chapter 22 just now, you saw the answers to the people's invitations. Uh, most of them weren't too, weren't too good, were they? In fact, the things that happened at my wedding or your wedding probably pale in comparison to this actual wedding ceremony. Imagine if you're the king <laughs> and you invite these people and this happened to you. Okay, That would be horrendous. Uh, in this parable, Jesus is talking in a parable. A parable is a earthly story with a heavenly or kingdom, kingdom meaning. I was talking about the kingdom of heaven. It's really something about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, 
This is written, it, this is, he, he, he was saying this, he was talking to these folks in Jerusalem, and uh, the, one of the main points of this passage is that he's opening up, God's going to open up, Jesus is going to open up, salvation to all people. Because he came to the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles. But we know, we know from scripture and history that the beginning, at least, meant most of the Jewish people, even today, reject the Messiah, right? They're still looking for the Messiah. So the Lord has opened up salvation, or being born again, or being saved, as we say it a lot of times, to all. Thank the Lord for that, right? Amen. Amen to that. Um, so earthly story with a kingdom meaning. Uh, who is present in this passage? Well, uh, if you go back to chapter 23, verse 21, you find out that the scribes and religious leaders and the elders are present. Probably also with the disciples who traveled with Jesus for three years, three and a half years. Uh, these guys are the guys along with the Pharisees and Sadducees who are always trying to catch Jesus doing something wrong, right? Everything that he did, they always had questions. They always tried to trap him. They always tried to, to try to get him to say something wrong or do something wrong so they could convict him. So they could uh, to, you know, make him look bad uh, to the people and whoever else. And that kept going and kept going and kept going. In fact, this is Passion Week when this is happening. So... Passion Week, we know how that started, right? Jesus comes in on a donkey. The people praise him. But halfway through the week, people were mad at him, against him. He uh, got mad at him about the money changer thing in, in, in the temple. And so he's got that on his mind. He tells this parable to reveal, to, to confront these, these religious leaders, hopefully to get them to think about that, what they're really doing. Now we know from history we didn't. But that was, that was one of his concerns. <coughs> so he says the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. In that wedding feast, uh, the traditional view is that the king represents God. The son is Jesus, of course. And the servants, God's prophets. Not so much the God's prophets at that day, day and time, but the God the prophets of the Old Testament. And how the Jewish people the Jewish, Jewish nation persecuted the prophets and killed many of them and uh, did not accept the message. Okay, the message of repentance, coming to God, and following God. So that's, that's, and some people can read into that and say, that, well, that, that also the servants are maybe Christians or serv servants of God in this day and age would be, would be Christians. Okay. Um, the call that it talks about, we're going to talk about, is, is basically <coughs> the fact that God calls everyone. The ones that are called are the ones who accept the message or accept the invitation. Uh, so we can get an invitation to something, but unless you accept the invitation, you show up and participate, what good is it, right? How many times have we had an invitation to something on, on the internet, on, on, on our email, or in the mail? And you looked at it and said, I'll oh, forget that and go away, right? Well, this is probably how the king felt in this story. Uh, he made this big wedding feast and um, wanted people to come to it and celebrate. And he got, and he got these answers that he got from these people. Uh, kind of reminds me back in 1981. Remember, actually, it's kind of in the news last week. Uh, Queen Elizabeth died. He knows about that. Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's uh, son is Charles III. Charles III married <coughs> Diana back in 1981. Maybe you watched it. Some of you watched it on TV. Uh, they said probably over 100,000 people attended, actually attended the ceremony, but over 2 billion people, they predict, watched it on TV. That's a lot of people watched it. And it didn't last. <laughs> they ended up getting divorced. But imagine. King, king getting married, some kind to a king or a queen, that's a big deal, right? So imagine this king having this wedding feast for his son, and he gets these answers that he's going to get. Make you pretty upset with it. So what I'm going to do in this passage is, I told you that Jesus is confronting the religious leaders about their unbelief, and he's offering salvation to all people. But what I want to take the next few minutes to do, I want, I want uh, what you have here is you have five responses in this passage 
to the invitation. Five different responses. And then a concluding remark by Jesus concerning this whole, whole passage. So let's look at those, let's look at some of those excuses. We'll see if we can relate to any of this. Because I want you, when I, when, as we talk about this, I want you to think about how sometimes we re, people react to the gospel, okay? Uh, if you've ever spoke to somebody about Jesus, whether it's in a hospital or uh, at work or on the street or at the grocery store or wherever it is, you get different responses, don't you? Yes. Now we like to hear, oh yeah, I'm interested. Let me, you know, I'll come to your church, or you yeah, know, uh, please let me know, you know. Or like I, the other night when I showed up that young gentleman's room and uh, explained the gospel to him, and he wanted, he wanted to accept Jesus. We like that. That's easy, right? But what if you get some of the other excuses? And there's all kinds of excuses. These are only five of them. I think they're, and they're also a picture of the responses of the Jewish folks. And by the way, I'm not picking on Jewish people. Okay? So please don't think that. But the Bible is, is pretty much a Jewish book about a Jewish Messiah. So we can't really leave it out. Okay? But it wasn't the Jewish, Jewish people that crucified Jesus and killed Jesus. It was all of us. Scripture tells us that we're all responsible. Because we've all sinned, right? So just know that, okay? So uh, here we go. Let's go. So let's get into some, some of the some of the excuses. Uh, in verse three, so I'll just read. So in verse three, it says Jesus speaks to them in parables. Verse two, the king of heaven is like a certain king, makes marriage to his son, and he sent out some of his servants to call them that were invited. So one group he called me, and, and I want to oh, I need to this and this. We don't do this, we do this a little bit nowadays, but uh, you send out an invitation to your wedding, you, what do you, maybe you should send them out a couple months ahead of time. Back in those days, it was about a year ahead of time. And then right before it's all ready to go, they sent out people to follow up and to make sure you're coming. So instead of a phone call and their phones, they sent people to your house to find out you're coming, you're coming, you're coming, you're coming. So this is where this is this is kind of the scenario that he's talking about here when he goes sends his servants out to certain groups of people that are invited and then their response. So the first response is when he he goes he sends some servants out. It says here that uh, they would not come. We don't know the reason, yet. but they just oh well, I'm sorry I can't make it. Well wait a minute, took the invitation out like a year ago. Oh I thought I forgot about it. you know thousands of. So it just simply says some of them, some of them that were invited just wouldn't show up. Just they just weren't there. Okay. All right. That's one response. And by the way, you're gonna run into people <coughs> when you talk to them about, about the Lord, they're gonna just flat out say to you, I'm not interested. Uh, I don't want to hear that, please. Uh, thank you anyway, but I, I don't some people will be violent, but other people it's like I, I'm not interested in that this people. I'll pass. So that's the first group. They wouldn't, they wouldn't come. So the interesting thing about this, about this passage is that, that the king doesn't give up after one shot. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't send the first group out. So, okay, well, they said no. Well, I'll forget it. I'm going to forget any of them. You know, we're just not going to do it. Or we're just get, no, we'll just get somebody else, right? He doesn't do that. He tries again. So well, here you go. So the second, second group he sends out. So again, it says... Uh, they would not come. So again, in verse four, he says he sent forth other servants, and he and he, and he kind of plays this one up. You ever done this? Like make something look really good, like to get people to come. And he says, uh, "I want you to go out and get some more people." And man, I'm going to kill the ox and the, the, and the, the fat lady, and, and I've made all things ready. And you know, invite them to come in. Tell them it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And really pump it up. You ever been to an event like that? And uh, when they went to their houses to ask them to make sure they're coming and try to sell it to them, it says they made light of it, they made fun of it. Oh, that wedding, I wouldn't go to that. I wouldn't be caught dead at that wedding. <laughs> Man, you're asking me that wedding. I threw that thing away when you sent it to me. Don't be bugging me about it. And they made fun of it and went their ways. And on top of that, some of them went to their Farms, the animals, and a bunch of their jobs. So, in other words, they made excuses. Do we hear excuses today? 
We use excuses all the time, don't we? Why a person can't do this or do that, or why a person doesn't want to hear about God, or don't want to listen to God, or don't want to listen to the Bible, or don't want to hear about Jesus, or even just in everyday life, we ask, we have questions, we have things we do, and people make these lame excuses, right? You ever heard of lame excuses? I could probably do a whole, we could probably do a whole night on just lame excuses that people give us, and that we have given to each other, and to God. Well, God, I, 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 can't, I can't do that, God, because, because, and we have an excuse, right? So that's what these guys did. They sent up the second set of servants. They went to these people's houses and they made fun of it. And said, I, I got something to do. I got to go to work. I got to do this. That's the second. So that's the second. Then verse 4 doesn't, hit, doesn't waste any time. He says, that, and the remnant, which means all of the, ones, the other portions of the people that they invited, it says they started to get violent. And they treated them spitefully or, or rudely. And it says that even sl even slew or killed, even killed some of these servants. So some said no, some made excuses, and some got mean about it and even killed the people who invited them. Wow. Really? That doesn't really sound realistic, does it? To ask somebody just to a wedding. But if it's more than a wedding, maybe it is realistic. Remember, this is a parable. Okay? So others treated them rudely and even killed them for asking if they're coming to the wedding. Well, in verses 7 and 8, it gets kind of uh, a little scary here. In verse 7 and 8, you have the king's response to not just the first two excuses, but to this excuse mostly because the people got hurt. And his answer is in verse 7 and 8 when he says, when the king heard that of what had happened, he was very angry. He sent out his army and he destroyed those murderers and he burned their houses and burned their cities. That's a pretty, that seems like a pretty radical Response to somebody saying no to a wedding until the third excuse, right? And then they actually killed people. Uh, many people believe that this is a reference to uh, destruction that they blamed on the, on, the, on the folks in 70 AD back in the, back in the first century uh, as, a, as a result of that. And that's a whole other topic. So in verse 8, he says to the servants, well, look, the wedding is ready. Everything's prepared. And the food is ready. Uh, but those that were invited so far were not worthy. We're not worthy. That's an interesting word, worthy. By the way, none of us are worthy. The Bible says our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So if we have to depend on our own good works or anything good about us, our race, our, our, race, our religion, our uh, nationality, our background, our financial situation, uh, any of that, nothing can make us worthy to God. It's only through his righteousness and through the cross of Christ and his grace alone, faith alone by Christ alone, that makes us worthy. So it's interesting he uses the word worthy. They were not worthy. So he tells the servants, he says, I want you to go out now, and I want you to go into the highways, I want you to go all over town, I want you to get anybody that you can get, get as many as you can find, and I want you to go out and get them, literally get them, and bring them, tell them what's going on, and bring them to the wedding. Oh, man. Some of the servants probably go, man, I don't know if I want to get some of these guys. You're going to get this guy? I want to bring this guy to the wedding? He's like, man, this is a king's wedding. It's his son. Oh, he doesn't look right. Or he doesn't, you know, I don't like his personality. But the king said, bring everybody. The king said, bring whoever will come. Wow. Bring whoever will come. For those who ever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13, 10, 10, 10, 9, 10, 10, 10, 13. Whosoever. So he says, go out and bring whoever will come. 
It sounds a lot like the gospel, doesn't it? Yes. I come to this guy and this guy and this group and this group, and they say no, but I'm not going to quit. And I, t I get to this group, and finally, everybody. So, it goes, so the whole point of that is that the, the, the gospel had come to the Jews first. The Jews had rejected it. And then now God is opening it up to every person. And the Jewish leaders that are listening to him say this parable are starting to get a little ticked. Because he's done it before and they know he's talking about them. And their rejection of who he is. And his message. And the message of the Old Testament that points everybody to the Messiah. So he destroys and burns their cities. He calls it calls them not worthy. Uh, he tells the rest of the guys how much to go out and get anybody that you can get. Bring them in. And I love what it says. Uh, in verse 10. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many, all as many as they would, could find, both the good and the bad. So what? Evil and good. Translation say. And the wedding was furnished with guests. It's kind of a positive statement, considering how it started, right? And all the invitations go out. So far, three groups and three groups said no. One group killed some people. And finally, he gets this fourth group and he goes off the track a little bit and says, let's just get anybody that'll come. Imagine if Princess Diana and Charles III had to do that. The streets of London, England. And, he, and, he, and so he says the, the wedding was furnished with guests. I can imagine it was packed, my friends. It was packed. Because I can tell you right now, and those, I don't know if you much about those, those, those feasts. Uh, you've been to maybe a feast in the church here. But the food alone would have been worth going to. From a king, for a king's table. Especially if people don't have anything. So they go out and they tell anybody about it. And all these people come in that weren't invited before necessarily. But now they're invited because he's opened it up to everybody. And they're probably like, they're probably really, really excited. I like that response, don't you? Don't you wish that you could go out right now to the store, to your neighbor, to your job, to the movie, or wherever you go. And you could tell people about God. And they would come. They just show up. Wow. Really? Oh, that could never happen, right? Could never happen. Could never happen. Why, why, why should we even try? Well, I want to tell you something real quick. I'm going to get off the subject of school for a little second. In the 1960s, there was a guy named, um, what's his name? Chuck Smith. I don't know Chuck. Chuck was a Calvary Chapel. Well, he was a he was a pastor. He was a little bit of church. Uh, came to Calvary Chapel churches, which is known as today. Uh, Greg Laurie on radio a lot, TV a lot. He's got one of the biggest churches in America now as Calvary Chapel. Um, doctrinally, I I don't I wouldn't say that I agree totally with everything they, they teach, but they teach salvation by grace, grace alone, by faith alone, by Jesus alone. And so, in nineteen sixties. Chuck Smith wanted to be a pastor, and he prayed, he, he prayed, God, I want, to, I want to reach people, but I just want a little bit of church. Just give me a little bit of church. And so, but I want to reach people. I want to reach people. So he had a handful of people in this church in, in uh, Newport Beach, California, Coastal Mesa, Coastal Mesa, California. And uh, he'd been praying, been faithful. And one day he comes to church, and lo and behold, this is the 60s. There's hippies everywhere. This is true. You, you can look this up. Hippies everywhere. <coughs> All over the church. It's close to the beach. All around, all around the church. Long hair, ripped clothes, jeans with lips on, short shorts, ultra tops, all this stuff. Hippies. They're in the church, they're outside the church, their feet, they got their bare feet on the pews. They're all over the place. Some of them. Just showed up. They went to the Bible, just showed up. But he didn't bring it. I want to reach people. 
So he comes to the church and he sees this and he's he's like, right. probably like the religious leader, right? He's talking about us. And he comes into the doors, and I can just imagine the look on his face. And he's looking at these, and they were smelly, I'm sure. And he's marching up to the table. He's gonna tell them off. He's a preacher. He's gonna go up there and tell them, get out of my church, you stinking hippies. It's true. True story. And he gets about halfway to the pulpit and God hits him. Boom! With a conviction. Didn't you say you want to reach people? Well, uh, yeah, but not these people. No, but did you say you want to reach people? Yeah, I did. Well, here they are. What are you going to do about it? So by the time he got up to the pulpit, his face changed, his countenance changed, his attitude changed, and he welcomed these guys. These women. Mm-hmm. He welcomed them into his church. And after that happened, history will tell you that that church exploded. And when I mean exploded, I mean exploded. From 1,500 people to thousands. All over the area. People, hippie people coming in, coming in, sitting in Bible studies for two hours while he talked on the scriptures. He got people getting saved, people getting baptized. He baptized hundreds, literally hundreds, thousands at the beach. So much going on, so much stuff he had to do that he needed help. And he had people come in and help him. And, and it's like, and it happened within months. Months. It was all over the world, it was all over the news in the United States. It was the Jesus Revolution. Maybe you heard that. The Jesus Revolution. And it's like, oh man, but these are just hippies. These people are long haired and they like that. They take drugs and blah, 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 blah. And all these people came here coming to his church and started getting saved, started changing their life, started changing, started cutting their hair. They got off the drugs, they quit drinking. They started getting married instead of living with people. And uh, it revolutionized Costa Mesa revolutionized Southern California. Because one guy, Chuck Smith, who wanted a little bitty church, said, God, I want a little bitty church, but I want to help people. He didn't put any stipulation on it. Probably should have said, oh, I only want the good people. <laughs> right? And God gave him a ton of people that nobody else, nobody else would count worthy. And as a result of that, now Chuck Smith is dead now. He's in heaven. But as a result of that, that movement is still going in the Calvary Chapel churches. And many of those people who were saved in the 60s under his leadership are now old like you and me, right? Some of us. And they're still in the church. And they're deacons and they're elders and they're some of them pastors. And they're passing on this message to their children and their grandchildren, and even their great-grandchildren. But they weren't worthy to the eyes of the world. They weren't even worthy to the secular society, by the way. The hippies. So he says, they're not worthy. So I want you to go out, and I want you to find them. So he brings them all in. He says, the, the wedding is furnished in a hurry. Furnished with guests. And so the king, he's excited. He comes in, he says, he sees the guests. He says, hey, uh, there was a man there in verse 11. They didn't have on a wedding garment. Let me explain that in a second, because uh, we don't do that today. Uh, you know, the, the, if you, unless you're on, unless you're in a wedding party, you don't get like a special dress or a special, you know, whatever, or a tuxedo, guys. So, but there was something that they would wear to recognize that they had been invited to the wedding and they were part of the wedding. It was given to you. And you were expected to wear it. Well, this guy shows up and he doesn't have it. He doesn't have it. And so the king says to him, he calls him friend, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's kind of a, like a sarcastic statement. Uh, I mean, God's sarcastic. Jesus was sarcastic. Because he's called people friends before in scripture. Sam, like his buddy, they were, he 
you stay in it till I count over, and we'll stay out. Okay? Well, Jesus would do that, wouldn't he? He said, Friend, how'd you get in here? You didn't have your wedding garment on. And the guy, it says, was speechless. See it there, verse 12? He was speechless. He felt so guilty that he's trying to sneak in to the wedding when he didn't have to sneak in. He just had to wear the wedding garment. So, so these responses, these five responses are how people respond to the gospel. There's other responses, but some will say no. Some will make fun of it and say, I got something to do. Some will be get mad at you and they'll punch you in the nose. Or they'll, whatever. Some will try to sneak in. That's where cults come from, by the way. False religions and cults. What is that? That's somebody trying to sneak in to the kingdom of heaven, doing their own thing. And then, of course, there's the ones that said yes. Praise God for that, right? Praise God that we were given another chance, right? Because if you're here tonight, you're a Christian, and you, and you love God, you're following God, it's because God gave you another chance. He gave you and me another chance. He didn't stop at the first invitation. Because if he just stopped the precipitation here, everybody would have been doomed. Because he's a compassionate God. He's not wanting any should perish. Not wanting that one person should die and leave this planet without him. Without him. I don't know about you, but that's exciting to me. Yes. Because you never know who it's going to be. Because he makes a statement at the end. And I end with this. He says... Many are called. Many are called. But few are chosen. What does that mean? Here's what I think it means. I think it means that God calls many, God calls everybody to himself. And it's the ones that respond back to him that are the chosen ones. I know we can get into Ar Armenianism and Calvinism and uh, God chose to put us the foundation of the world and this and that and all that and this and that. So my choice, blah, 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 blah. But basically what it comes down to is everybody is chosen. It's the ones that respond that come to Christ. And guess what? We don't know who they are. Do you? We don't know who the chosen are. So even if we're going to hold to that doctrine, we tell everybody why? Because we don't know Who's going to say yes? The ones that the king just expected to say yes in the story said no. Didn't they? They all made excuses. Some of them killed him. Some of them made fun of it. Whatever. So what did he do? He had to ask people that he would not have asked on a regular basis. The hippies. Right? The low life. The drunkards. Prostitutes. The lepers. And he said, come. And whoever showed up got the wedding garment and participated in the wedding feast of the Lamb. And by the way, those wedding garments are representative of Christ's righteousness that we have to have upon ourselves to be able to be worthy to be in that wedding feast. So how do I get that thing? I accept the invitation. Right? Accept the invitation. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Christian life easy? No, man, it's not easy. I've been Christian since I was 15. I'm 63. Sometimes it is very hard. I'd use that other word, but I don't need that. Sometimes it's hard. Persecution, problems we go through, all the stuff of life. You know, you've been along very long, very long. You know, we've been in this world very long. You know, you know what happens. You know what you You see it everywhere. Guess what? I was invited. You were invited. What are you going to do with that invitation? You're going to throw it in the trash? I'll accept it. Yeah. And what are other people going to do? You can't make other people believe and come to the wedding, but you can sure invite them and have a conversation with them and try to show them the love of God. Not just tell them the love of God, but show them the love of God. What does that mean? It means acts of service. It means praying for them. It means going out of your way to help people. 
It doesn't matter if you, it's not like I gotta get this obnoxious on my belt. Oh, I saved five people this week. So I'm a good person, I'm a righteous person. It's not, it's not about any of that. It's the most godly people in the world are people that haven't led that many people to the Lord, but they sure told a lot of people. I never wrote a missionary, can't remember his name right now, and I'm gonna be done. Uh, he went to this country for seven years. Seven years. In fact, the, the story, the, the, he wrote a little book, it's not a comedy show, but it's called The Pineapple Story. Maybe you've heard of it. He went to this country for seven years and preached the gospel every day to these people in this village. And not one convert in seven years. Not one. Would that be discouraging? Yes. Seven years. He lived with them. He served them. He did all in this stuff. And finally, after seven years, when he made a one little one little change in his life, they all came. Oh, now missionary, you are a Christian now. Wait, but I was Christian all along. No, but you are a Christian now. And I won't go into what happened, but basically, he changed some, his personality and how he was treating them, and they realized it and said, "You are now a Christian. Your God is real." They came. Sometimes it's simple as that. People know you care. You go out of your way to help them, pray for them. You're not judgmental. Uh, you don't. You don't look at people that are hit, look different than us and treat them differently. That's all the gospel. Jesus hung out with prostitutes, with sinners, with tax collectors, with murderers, all these different kinds of people, and he never, never turned anybody away. Not even the religious guys that tried to kill him. He didn't turn them away. Yeah, he had some things to say about it, but he kept offering it to them. Yeah. Do you know how many times that Jesus confronted, or they confronted him in the Gospels, the religious leaders? Do you know how many times? That should be, we should, you should go look that up. Go through the Gospels and count the number of times that Jesus confronted or they confronted him in the Gospels and see how many times Jesus put up with their stuff. And then sit there and tell me that God's not a compassionate God. That God doesn't give second, third, fourth chances. And that he doesn't love every person, including the ones that persecute him. That's Christianity, guys. That's the Gospel. And that's what this parable is like. The parable is all about, and all the parables are about the kingdom of heaven. This one's so, so significant because he's exposing their excuses. And he's saying, even to that right there, please come. Please come. Please come. It's our choice. We can't make people do it, but we can tell them. We can love them. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come before you right now. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for this, this gospel message that we had in Psalm 20, in the, me, Matthew 22. How you've unfolded this whole thing about excuses, but really it's about the gospel and about uh, making excuses why we can't follow you. Thank you, Lord, for opening the gospel thing to all people, not just a certain group of people. Help us, Lord, never to think that we are better than someone else or that we deserve it more than someone else. Keep us humble, Lord. Keep us, keep our hearts close to you. And I pray, God, that each person in this room would have, be filled with your fervor and your excitement about sharing Jesus with other people that they might know you. Help us to do whatever we can to help that happen as we pray for them, love them, and care for them. And I pray that you would help this church God, to get so excited about you that they can't help but reach people for your glory and for their good. We ask all this in your precious name.
Let's pray. Dear God, thank you again for this day and for everything you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for the service you've allowed us to have um, just to hear your word and just re to reflect on your goodness, Lord. I'll be with all the requests that were made this evening and keep everyone safe as they go to their separate homes. We thank you again and praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.